Thanks for joining us for this look at the best original reporting from KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. And coming up, protection from monkeypox. We'll look at the vaccine situation locally as supplies run thin. And it's a challenge keeping college grads in San Diego. KPBS investigates why many young professionals are starting careers elsewhere. And see how soon-to-be released inmates are using gardening to grow skills that can help them on the outside. The coming days will bring back some of San Diego's biggest events since the start of the pandemic, just as COVID-19 re-emerges. The CDC elevated the region's risk level from medium to high on Friday. KPBS reporter John Carroll talked with doctors about the latest surge. We have been watching this virus evolve rapidly. From the White House to local hospital systems, the word is going out about the latest mutation of the coronavirus. There's no question that we are in the midst of a surge. Dr. William Seng is the assistant area medical director for Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. He says everyone should be stepping up their efforts to stay safe from the virus. Masking, distancing, all the precautions we've become so familiar with over the last couple of years. And Seng says this current surge is likely much bigger than we can measure. The numbers that we have are ones where we're able to test. So there's a lot of numbers that we can't see at this point because a lot of them are positive when they test at home. They don't let us know about the results. The latest surge is happening just as San Diego's two biggest events are about to unfold in person. Pride is expected to draw hundreds of thousands this weekend. Then, just a week later, Comic-Con descends on San Diego. Organizers are letting everyone know strict rules will be in place. Attendees, vendors, everyone will have to wear a mask at indoor events. The mask has to be visible outside of costumes. Verification of full vaccination status or proof of a negative test taken within 72 hours must be shown. And it's all subject to change. We asked Pride organizers what measures they're taking, but they didn't respond by the time this story went into edit. The statement has always been, if you're outside, you're okay. Dr. Ghazala Sharif is the chief medical officer for acute care operations at Scripps. She says being outside is safer, but... With these variants being so infectious, we still have to be extra careful. Dr. Sharif says the number of people with COVID is climbing throughout the Scripps system, as with all hospitals in the county. We reached out to multiple people with the county health department for a comment, but no one got back to us in time for inclusion in this story. Fortunately, we are much better prepared now for an increase in cases. There are treatments like monoclonal antibodies and drugs like Paxlovid that are very effective. But you can hear the concern in the voices of Dr. Sharif and saying, another surge is building and big events with lots of people will help fuel it. John Carroll, KPBS News. And on a smaller scale, there's another health concern, especially among those who might find themselves at Pride celebrations this weekend. KPBS health reporter Matt Hoffman explains why the LGBTQ community is paying close attention to monkeypox. At least six cases of monkeypox have been reported in San Diego County. Nationwide, just under a thousand cases have been confirmed. The illness spreads through close contact, and it can cause rashes or flu-like symptoms, but most people don't need to be hospitalized. The fact that transmission um, is more difficult means that the risk to the general public is really low. County Public Health Officer Dr. Ankita Kadakia says they haven't found evidence of community spread, although that's likely to change. Just like with COVID, monkeypox can infect anyone in San Diego County. Nationwide, the CDC reports gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men have made up a majority of the early cases. But officials stress anyone who comes in close contact with someone who has monkeypox, whether that be sexual or otherwise, can be infected. I want to be really clear that this is not a disease of gay men or bisexual individuals or transgender individuals. This is a disease that we just happen to be seeing spreading currently. Ahead of Pride weekend, county health officials are offering monkeypox vaccines to those considered high risk. 600 appointments were made available and all of them were quickly filled. This was not a decision that was made solely by the county or a unilateral decision. It was really a collaboration with LGBTQ leaders. Organizations including San Diego Pride have been helping spread the word about vaccination events. One of the great things about the LGBT community is that we take care of one another, that we understand public health, 
and we lean in to support and educate one another. So I'm really excited to see how folks are approaching that. Fernando Lopez is the executive director of San Diego Pride. They do worry about some creating a false stigma. What is really important that when we're talking about a public health issue, that monkeypox, uh, meningitis, uh, COVID, these are illnesses, right, that can impact anyone. And so the danger is when folks, particularly in the media right now, are making those sort of illnesses out to be anything other than what they are, diseases that um, do not discriminate. Andrew Picard was one of the lucky few who managed to get vaccinated Wednesday. Picard appreciates how local health officials have handled messaging. I think as a member of the LGBTQ community, we're very familiar with um, illnesses being stigmatized and, and receiving stigma um, as a community. Um, I think there's been great education and awareness activities done by the county. And let's face it, just like COVID, any illness is a human illness. This is a human reality. When we have limited uh, access to vaccines like we do now, it's important to identify which populations are at high risk and prioritize interventions for those communities. So I'm glad to see that that's happening here. It's not clear when the county will offer more vaccine appointments. The federal government is in charge of distributing vaccines and regions with the highest official case counts are given the most doses. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Starting this Saturday, a new resource is available for those in a mental health crisis. 988 is a new three-digit number people can call or text to connect with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That's in addition to the National 800 number. However, those in need of immediate medical attention are still urged to call 911. Beginning a new life in a new country comes with its own amount of stress. Jacob Ayer introduces us to a program meant to build a support system for those who are new to San Diego. Nyadoth Gatkwoth is the daughter of refugees from South Sudan who was looking for help in a support system in San Diego. She found it in a group called Girl Talk. Having Girl Talk, it's kind of just like, I don't necessarily go to a therapist, but like that's kind of like my therapy in a sense. The monthly support group is designed for South Sudanese women. These are women who I see myself in, so it's basically kind of like a mirrored experience when I am in that space. I see people who are me, and I see, and, I, and I'm able to... Um, I'm able to, you know, empathize with what they're going through and sympathize as well. Girl Talk is organized by United Women of East Africa, or UW East. Sympathy and empathy are just part of what's offered. They talk about housing issues, they talk about food insecurity issues and so on and so forth. And so I think what this program has done is expanded what mental health means. UW East is one of several agencies in the San Diego Refugee Coalition's Behavioral Health Initiative. It's the first peer-based, non-clinical mental health program to provide free, specialized services for immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. The program's counselors speak 13 different languages and are all refugees or immigrants themselves. People feel comfortable to talk to somebody who can understand the culture, who speak their languages. Dilkwa Zahamed is the CEO of License to Freedom, an organization that's taken the lead on providing mental health services to refugees in San Diego. In the past year alone, the Behavioral Health Initiative has helped over 2,000 people, but stigmas around finding help are still very prevalent in the communities these groups serve. Promised Land is with the Karen Organization of San Diego. For our parents and older generation, they never really like get to really think about their mental health when they were in like refugee camp because they really think about like survival and stuff. So it's a new thing, you know, you move here to the United States and then it's a different battle, um, you know, fighting mentally. Behavioral health specialist Nayamal Wall counsels refugees and facilitates the Girl Talk support group. I think they're assimilating every day. And even though a lot of refugees from South Sudan have been here since like the early 90s, it's still like an everyday struggle for them. The initiative offers one-on-one -on -one counseling, educational workshops, and essential resource navigation. On a weekly basis, I'll meet with it, I could meet with anyone, like I could meet with older adults who don't really speak much English 
and I could meet with young women and just um, help counsel them and talk to them about anything. And those talks are making a difference for young women like Yaquo. I lost a sister earlier this year and so just having that space to be able to talk about what I'm experiencing and having other sensitive individuals who have lost siblings or have lost somebody close to them and having that safe space to be able to you know speak about what you're going through and just having people with that shared experience it means a lot and it's very important to me. Wall says the girl talk model is starting to grow and more southern Sudanese women across the U.S are coming together to talk about their mental health. We've been able to like expand Girl Talk to other states outside of California. There's mostly um, South Sudanese in the Midwest, so like Nebraska, Iowa, um, North Dakota, South Dakota. So like we've been able to like reach out to more young women. And Ahmed at License to Freedom says that's just what they want to see for the Behavioral Health Initiative. Other organization can come and uh, take some of the, the lesson that what works and why this program is successful. It's because it came from the people themselves. For those worried about seeking help, Gakwalt has a message. No matter how small your issue is, just reach out, tell somebody, and there's always somebody willing to give you, and, you know, an open ear and uh, who with open hearts to be able to accept whatever you're saying and they'll also be able to help you with whatever you're going through. The Behavioral Health Initiative services are free and people looking for help can learn more at San Diego Refugee Communities .org. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. And here are some of the most read stories this week at KPBS.org. San Diego launches its parks and after Parks After Dark program to bring events to local neighborhoods. KPBS Midday Edition has a QA on monkeypox and San Diego's response. And our ongoing coverage of the recent surge in COVID-19 cases as big events return. Thousands of people come to San Diego for a college education, but it's a challenge keeping them after they earn their degree. KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser looks at how San Diego compares to other cities competing for college grads. Devin Lecox Jones. Devin Lacacus Jones says he's living his dream. He graduated from UC San Diego last year and is staying here, following in his parents' footsteps. I think just the way like I was kind of raised, both my parent, both my parents were high school teachers, and that kind of uh, influenced my pathway to become a high school teacher. But new data show Lacacus Jones is not among the majority of his classmates. Only 40% of UC San Diego students stay in the region after graduation. And for every 100 graduates from all local colleges and universities, the region retains just 99 of them, according to a new study. Meanwhile, Los Angeles and San Francisco attract more college graduates than they produce. This is a significant disparity that has both short and long-term impacts on the region's economy and competitiveness, says Ray Major, the chief data and analytics officer at the San Diego Association of Governments. Businesses need to be able to expand here, right? So we need to have a, a, a business-friendly um, environment where these people can, can open their business, expand their operations, hire their people, and the people can work there and, and, and live relatively closely at a reasonable cost. There are also other options local leaders could explore, says Jonathan Konzelman, co-author of the study. One of the ways you can sort of target um, that funding is towards maybe schools who do tend to retain more students within the local area. That funding could be used in part to help lower income San Diegans afford local colleges, says Daniel Enemark, the senior economist at the San Diego Workforce Partnership. If we were able to make it possible for people who don't have as much family wealth to get a college education, I think the likelihood of them staying here is much higher, especially if we can connect them with employers as part of the process. He says the need for college graduates is especially acute in the current labor market. Right now in San Diego, there are two unfilled jobs for every unemployed person. Plus, employers need to pay more. If they didn't get an 8.2% raise, they are making less money this year than they were making last year. Yeah, the three or four percent doesn't cut it in terms of how do we retain more workers in San Diego? And that is, we got to pay them more. That's being felt by recent college grads like Lacacus Jones, who's living in Ramona because it's one of the few places in the county he can afford. 
Meanwhile, his college friend Joseph Polk moved to the Stockton area to become a lawyer and work on a horse ranch. I think UCSD is like, I think it helps San Diego kind of build a really good base for um, like professionals going, going um, from college into the real world. But many of those students are going into the real world outside the San Diego region. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. The return of an in-person Pride Festival this weekend also brings an effort to minimize the effects of illegal drug use. M.G. Perez explains how the practice of harm reduction can save lives. I like to keep everything in order so it's easier to just give them what they need. Heather Newhart has 30 years of experience in social work and drug treatment strategies. She often works on the streets, supporting homeless addicts through the Harm Reduction Coalition of San Diego. That means filling paper bags to go with toiletry items, as well as clean needles to inject illegal drugs, and boxes of Narcan, the nasal spray that revives someone who has overdosed on opioids and stops breathing. If you want to come down here, I'll gladly give you some fentanyl strips. Okay, um. These days, Newhart and her team also take calls from people who want to test their street drugs for the potent synthetic opioid fentanyl before using them. Fentanyl is 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine or heroin. It's just so easy to overdose on a very, very small amount. Ed or Helis is shadowing Newhart and the coalition's street team, learning how to support addicts who are still using. He is the program leader of Step In a new harm reduction outreach to the county's LGBTQ community. According to the National Library of Medicine, gays and other sexual minorities are more than twice as likely to abuse drugs than their straight peers, or Helis is one of them. I can tell you my story, but, uh, you know, I was actually not breathing for part of it, so... This section of Balboa Park near Morley Field is known as a cruising spot with drug activity after dark some nights. That's something Orhelis relates to. Before getting clean and sober from heroin, he tried smoking fentanyl for the first and only time. I saw the smoke come out of my mouth, and that was it. That's all I remember. The next memory I have is um, I was kind of all scrunched up on my friend's couch and I didn't understand why I was all scrunched up. And I was like, what happened? And he said, I had to hit you with Narcan. He said, I had to hit you with Narcan twice. Narcan helped start his heart and saved his life. It also started his road to recovery from addiction. Now, Urhelis is working to get Narcan into the hands of other LGBTQ users before they die. The Step In program will provide other life-saving resources, too. The call for help begins with a simple text message to the Step In hotline. What to do in case of an overdose, how to recognize a, a, an overdose. Um, so we'll have a lot of information, a lot of education, and uh, hopefully it'll give us a way to, to maintain that dialogue with uh, folks that are sometimes honestly very difficult to reach. One, we admitted we were products of alcohol. Just a couple of blocks from the pride flag, recovering addicts and alcoholics have found a safe haven at the Live and Let Live Alano Club in the heart of Hillcrest. The majority of members are LGBTQ, although anyone is welcome to attend the almost 50 meetings a week that include 12-step recovery and harm reduction. Robert Tice is one of the club's board members who is also a drug counselor in a South Bay hospital emergency room. Fentanyl is something that will cause an overdose within seconds. And if you don't have Norcan ready, um, it's almost immediate death. Tice says the crisis is that almost every street drug is now laced with fentanyl, which you can't see, smell, or taste until it's too late. The Alano Club is partnered with the county health department and provides free Narcan at the coffee bar for anyone who wants it. No questions asked. While the Alano Club is struggling to keep its doors open after a long COVID shutdown, board members are committed to whatever it takes to keep people alive. Harm reduction meetings mean that we believe that we can't judge that abstinence-based program is the only way for you to get sober. There's a lot of stigma that goes just with addiction. You add the fact that we're working primarily with LGBTQ population 
and there's even more stigma on top of that. Pam Highfill is the outpatient director of Stepping Stone, the nationally recognized LGBTQ recovery program with a residential facility in City Heights. She is supervising the new step-in program, reaching out to those who need help the most. Gay men and women, transgender and non-binary and asexual people dying in their addiction. When do you give up on an addict? Never. Not me. Ed or Helis didn't give up either. He is carrying his story, message, and resources to addicts out there still suffering. All of my good choices and bad choices have led me to this moment, and this is where I'm at right now. A glimmer of hope and pride that could be just a text message away. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. Gardening is the latest tool aimed at keeping soon-to-be-released inmates out of prison. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado shows us how men and women are growing skills that will help them make the transition. Tomatoes are grown back there. We have all types of vegetables. There's nurseries and expansive gardens in places you might not expect. The men's East Mesa re-entry facility in Otay Mesa and at the Women's Las Colinas Detention Reentry Program in Santee. Right now we're just cleaning up off the dead stuff, off of the flowers. The people caring for the plants and vegetables are inmates with less than six months left in their sentences. 8.66 pounds. Here, they're just students learning the art of horticulture, landscaping, and farm-to-table sustainable growing. The leaves of the other succulents. 38-year-old Pemberton Tran has become quite the expert in succulents. So what I'm doing is, uh, since I'm reproducing, right, and it, it, you see, you clearly see the roots, right, growing, and I'll, I'll, I'll cut the end of the other leaf, right, and then I'll just repot it. And 20-year-old Brianna from the Coachella Valley. Yeah, these are very, very sweet. And they're, there's nothing better than tasting something right off the vine or from the soil. Now considers herself a farmer. Never would I have thought, but I'm very glad that I am. <laughs> Francisco Quinteros is a supervising correctional counselor with the program. We also have the oak trees that are almost ready to take to our county parks. He says they're growing more than plants here. They're helping people grow. We're investing in people here. So it's just really rewarding knowing that, you know, we're helping individuals that never got a chance um, in life. And now we're, you know, equipping them with the proper tools necessary to not come back. Tran can't believe he's become so skilled in such a short amount of time. This peaceful greenhouse is a sharp contrast from a life he's healing from. No, this is all new to me, you know. So I'm a, a combat veteran you know, and a recovering addict. And I came back feeling suicidal and I, I felt like no one understood. And uh, this program, uh, civics program, has been um, pretty much a safe haven for me to uh, rehabilitate and uh, work on recovery. This program is a partnership between the San Diego Sheriff's Department and the San Diego County Parks and Recreation Department. When inmates complete the program, not only will they have the know-how and certification, they will also be given connections to land a job. Tran says in an odd way, it's given him freedom, not just in here, but on the outside too. We gotta have options, you know? Um, so my, my mind is, when, when I step out that door, at least I know I have this as an avenue of seeking employment. When you have something really good, I think that you just want to share it with people. Brianna says she plans to take what she's learned and give back to her community. We have a community garden in Desert Hot Springs. I don't know how it's doing right now, but I would really love to do something and show what I learned to other people. Her favorite thing to grow? I really like the flowers because the flowers are super resilient. They grow and they die and they just come right back and they're just... I love them. A perfect metaphor for second chances. Exactly what this program provides. When you fall, you should always get back up. And I think that getting back up isn't just, oh, okay, I'm going to try it again. No, it's you're going to find something that works for you. 
And I think that this works for me because it makes me mindful and it makes me genuinely happy. Over at East Mesa, Tran says back in the day, his mom would try to get him to garden with her. And I'm like, oh, I don't, I, I got stuff I need to do. But now he's looking forward to giving her a hug and a hand in the backyard. I only have my mom left. You know, my dad passed away last year. And um, I think this, this experience right here um, was meant to be, you know, for so when I get released, I'd be able to spend more quality time with her, you know, and um, maybe I could teach her a few things <laughs> or she could teach me a few things, you know. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. Finally, a trip to Birch Aquarium in La Jolla. Alexander Nguyen visited a new exhibit for a group of penguins with a special look that's all their own. Meet pink and purple, magic and azulito, some of the resident penguins at the new exhibit opening at the Birch Aquarium this Wednesday. Azulito means tiny blue in Spanish. The name was chosen through an online contest, and it's a perfect name for this little guy because... Their f plumage has a really unique sort of navy color that um, really shines in the sun. It has different hues of almost aqua or cornflower blue, um, and that's pretty unique to the species. Kayla Street is the penguin expert at Birch. Of the 18 species of penguins, this is the only one that's blue. The exhibit is the first seabird exhibit at the aquarium, but Birch has been researching penguins for decades. The aquarium is affiliated with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. These penguins are the smallest in the world. They're native to Australia and New Zealand, and this is the only place you can see them on the West Coast. Nine-year Aria Ryer got a sneak peek of the penguins when she visited the aquarium with her parents and brother. She thinks they're cute, but worries about their size. She is right. They are small. Just exactly how small? About a foot tall, or the size of the California burrito. The exhibit opens Wednesday. Just follow the little blue penguin footprints. The aquarium is open for extended hours during the summer. Alexander Nguyen, KPPS News. And we do want to note that the Birch Aquarium is a supporter of KPBS. We hope that you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Thanks for joining us.